David will today be talking about the uh, the XX coin, the XX, ne uh, XX network, um, and and also we are um, we're talking about uh, democracy, voting, and and all these things that could be enhanced with uh, with with blockchain technology. And David's visions on that. We had a conversation earlier about six weeks ago, where we where we had uh, where we where we spent quite a bit of time talking about these uh, these subjects. And David has some uh, some very interesting ideas, um, and is also actively looking for collaborators on this uh, on this project. Um, so, in, in, in particular, uh, interest in the Berlin community also to uh, um, to reach out and to and to help him build what he's what he's looking for. Great, uh, yeah. Uh, I've, I've got a whole presentation here which I could oh, awesome. uh, yes. I could I could give if I can figure out how to. Uh, let's see. I've got to uh, move. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks again, Sylvan. So uh, yeah, let me let me start with the the XX coin, and then we'll we'll, we'll talk about uh, blockchain governance and and voting and the initiatives we have. Um, so this is basically a little scrapbook of our uh, company. You can see uh, these are when we launched like two years ago, and uh, with the messenger and the, the uh, uh, we announced a company a couple of years ago, and so forth and so on. And this our Cayman office. You can see here in the uh, upper left the view from our window, and this is our LA office and some of the members of the team. And uh, here we are. Uh, here I am in the Ber in Berlin at the uh, uh, Web three uh, presenting and 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 so forth. This is a little scrapbook. Um, the XX coin is really unlike all other cryptocurrencies. It's, uh, we're calling it high performance because it, it's the only one that has national laboratory level uh, security. And it's, you know, it's true digital cash, right? It settles in less than 10 seconds instead of, uh, you know, it's, uh, it provides and uniquely provides both types of, of unlinking of privacy. So the horizontal type is the linking between transactions, if you will, that of course, as you know, is uh, not hidden in current chains. And then we, we also have the, the other type of, of privacy, which is, which no, I don't believe any chain is, which is where, who makes each payment is also uh, unlinked. So your IP address or your location is unlinked from the transactions. And when you combine those, you can have perfect privacy in, uh, in payments. So this is uh, something that we have that's quite uh, uh, powerful. And we uh, have this payment technology in our network. Uh, even though users don't have to pay fees, we want uh, commercial users of the messenger and so on to pay fees to, and those will support the, the nodes. And the, it also, of course, provides a way for the community to participate and support what we're doing. So I think the, the special thing about, about the XX coin is that it's really secure and unlike anything else and really like cash in terms of its privacy and it, it has like dramatic scalability and it's uh we'll see later it's uh it's actually uh receiving quite a bit of backing from the community so this is the the schedule of uh like the milestones that we've achieved so we launched just like a couple of years ago, announced what we we're doing, and then we've we'll, we'll see some of these things. We have hundreds of beta nodes have signed up. We, the messenger has been used by you know thousands of people on iOS and Android, and and um, we only announced the Praxis project uh, less than a year ago. Be, so, but it was always planned. So, you see, you'll hear about 
it, we'll, we'll see it in the next slide, I think, how the XX uh, network is the combination of uh, Praxis and Elixir. So where we are right now is we've got bunches of beta nodes signed up um, and we, by popular demand, we decided to open the, the beta node application process again after a year uh, for just a couple week window and I'll, I'll come back to that. And we're, we're targeting mainnet for the end of this calendar year. Um, and that's, um, basically our timeline. Let me see if I can get this. Yeah. So here's, here's an overview of the, the technology and you can see how the different parts of the project fit together. There are actually two projects, the, the original Elixir uh, project, which is basically, you could call it a, a high speed mixing network. It, it does mixing like what I defined in the late seventies. Okay. But it, it does it by pre-computing, so it does all the heavy lifting in advance so that when a batch of inputs arrives, uh, a team of nodes is assembled and chosen unpredictably at random and they process this and permute it at each stage independently. And then those messages include payments and messages. And so there's a separate consensus mechanism that produces blocks that incorporate the payment transactions and also records of, of uh, the uh, messages that were sent. And that is this uh, Praxis project, which we announced last August, uh, but it was always sort of planned to fill in and make us a complete full stack. So our, our chain is, uh, you know, all the way from, uh, well, the, we have the, the Android and iOS apps and desktop apps. Then we have the uh, kind of DDoS resistant gateway network. It's operated by the same node, node operators. And then we have the actual nodes. And um, those nodes will be running both the messaging software and the consensus method and so we have this special endorser so the, the, the combined branding now is just you know we're going by xx network when these these two projects elixir and praxis have merged and we're uh, fortunate to have a very efficient way to i shall come to the next slide achieve consensus and i guess that's shown here so, you know, many chains, of course, as you know, don't actually even have consensus, but um, what we've been able to do when no one else has achieved, uh, as far as I can understand, uh, total linear scalability, and actually we're sublinear in part because we use a fixed size endorser set, which moves around a few hundred nodes, which are randomly uh, rearranged and so that's constant size which is actually even better than linear but it, uh, so it's it's quite efficient and so we can scale to according to our estimates uh, just with the current way we're doing things like 50 million users uh, and then we have a way to amp that up linearly easily but it's um, so quite scalable and part of that is the, the compact endorsement signatures and fast, which are compact enough that even the smartphones can check them. Uh, and that's an important feature of blockchain, which is, you don't often see, that the actual users can check the integrity of the, of the blocks without having to uh, run a lot of computation. And I mean, another thing that's quite different, uh, as far as I understand from any other chain, is that you know we use what, what I sometimes call national laboratory level secure cryptography. So all other chains use what I, I now want to like call fake standards because the governments that propose these standards don't actually use them themselves to protect their own secrets. 
So I think that's not really a standard. It's a fake standard that a lot of people call strong cryptography and happily use, but really this is not the kind of thing that governments would use to protect their own secrets. And so that's why uh, we use our own national laboratory level security, which is, is, has the benefit of also being fully quantum resistant. So we're, we're talking about random functions that are you know, uh, very, very, uh, very wide. And so basically you think of it as a very heavy duty hash functions that are, that are so big that they're, they're uh, quantum resistant. And so we built the whole thing with that. Uh, even, and even so, it's extraordinarily efficient. So it's, it's really quite, quite surprising. I mean, to have B of T consensus with basically linear scalability and quantum resistance, there's no one that has any of those things really. That's uh, it's quite, uh, you know, using have quantum resistant cryptography doesn't make it easier to, to have uh, uh, efficiency and scalability. So but it's quite a, it's quite a feat that we've been able to, to combine those and achieve like the, and high performance. So it's far and away the best uh, consensus and, and currency uh, technology that, that, that we've seen. And, um, you know, if, you, if you're concerned about national adversaries and so on, you might really want to think about using this type of cryptography. And if you want scalability to really make a difference, then, you know, you have to have a, something that's uh, truly scalable. So I, we're, we're, we're extremely excited about what we've been able to achieve. And I'd like to uh, urge you to look at our white paper which is up on our website. And then the, there's two technical papers that are the companions that back up everything. It's in the white paper, which introduces it at a little bit higher level. So it's all uh, uh, fully uh, 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 disclosed what we're doing. And, and we have, no one's found any flaws in it that we've heard of and it uh, seems quite sound. And um, so let, let me just talk about consensus a little bit because because we've taken a kind of unique approach to this. And you know, if you just step back and look at the question, you know, the issue, how can you get a, uh, many, many untrusted computers to work together to create a centralized network? Well, there are, let's say, two main known ways, right? You, you can do so-called proof of work or proof of stake, but each of these really is just what I would call proof of most money, if you will, right? Because if, you know, to win the contest where the contest is gonna be won by the party with the most resources most of the time, the proof of work is, you know, proof of more money, right? And, and proof of stake is also, you know, obviously more directly proof of more money, right? So the more people with the, the lot, most proof of stake networks give them, you know, more stake, more control. So these are proof of more money systems. What we want to do and are doing with the XX network is quite different. It's, I would call it, say, uh, PQRS, like in the alphabet, right? Proof of quantum random sampling. And this, I believe, is true consensus because it's egalitarian. It's everyone has the same uh, vote and the same participation in the upside and uh, role in, in, uh, in running the system. So if you when you really, I, in my view, think deeply about consensus, it turns out that a critical thing is how do you generate random numbers that everyone can trust and, and, and that everyone can be sure that no one can manipulate them. And this is, is the key ingredient really. And once you have that, you can use it to nominate block producers so you don't really need uh, proof of more money. 
and you can use it to you know vote on selecting things and randomly selecting endorser sets and, and everything. So what I'm saying here at the top of the slide is that in some sense, but I'm not prepared to argue this in a real formal or, you know, I don't want to get into the ontology or, you know, the theory, but roughly speaking, I think consensus is in some way equivalent to having an unmanipulatable randomness. And I think this has been missed by the community. And it's our starting point for our consensus uh, technique. So I think this is an, a really important uh, contr contribution and it, it levels the playing field. Okay, but uh, this is where I'd like to segue to the, the stuff that Sylvan and I were talking about a couple months ago about how just having consensus does not a decentralized future make. That there's another ingredient that's strictly necessary and that is democratic control over the governance of the network. Absent that, it's probably going to, you know, not be able to adapt and survive. Or if it's not democratically controlled, it may be co-opted and, and usurped and, and, and uh, used for other purposes. So, David, um, yeah. now we're still on the, on the subject. Uh, there are two questions coming in around around XX Coin specifically. So, oh yeah, perhaps, let's, perhaps, let's perhaps go back should, to that. Yeah, perhaps we'll, perhaps we should have a very quick look at those questions before we dive into yeah, the other just, section. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Right. So I wasn't sure I was talking to anyone, so it's nice to hear you. Oh, so yeah, it's yeah, a no. funny experience. <laughs> you know, you're 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 talking to your computer. It's kind of. Yeah, it is. It is a weird experience, isn't it? Yeah. And it's good that, yeah. that at least we can have a bit of a conversation in front yes. of uh, the audience, right? Um, so the, the question that uh, that came up here is is at the time of the previous XX sale, it was not allowed for U.S. person to buy the coin. Had, has that changed now? Is there is it is there a wider possibility right now for U.S. persons? No. Mm. I'm sorry. I mean, it, 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 it remains only the... getting worse in the U.S. Mm. <laughs> not better. Right. I mean, I was really truthfully expecting things would be improving by now and uh but it, it seems that to be moving in the opposite direction and that's that's unfortunate i think for the us and um yeah so we, we i have to agree you know yeah. so our hands are are tied more or less we don't really have much choice in this right uh, the, the the second question that that came in and 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 please everyone remember to use the Q and A function so that allows us to structure the questions nicely. Um, the next question is that uh, even with the new smaller better node specs, most users come on a main node to participate say, in the larger. So can you say? Can you say that again, please? Sure, sure. Sorry. Um, even with the new smaller better node spec, most users come on a main node to participate in the larger consensus using their existing PC. And the question is if that will be possible in the future. Is that a correct understanding and will it be possible in the future? Well, I don't think it's a correct understanding and I don't think it will be an issue in the future, but, um, you know, the, 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 okay. so currently we are paying beta nodes quite generously to participate and the expectation is that mainnet nodes will uh, similarly, well, they'll, you know, they'll, there's more upside in being a mainnet node, obviously. And the cost of the computer hardware and the, and any of the communication uh, bandwidth that's needed is, uh, from what I understand, modest. In fact, I think. It, it's less than what we pay per month for the, uh, for you to do it. So, I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 this gets back, you know, this gets back to your whole idea. Do you think it's really great the way it is now where everyone can run this stuff, but, you know, but actually only a few people control the whole situation 
or would you like to have a, a system where there are a lot of people who are actually on an equal footing running the network? And the latter is what we, we've chosen for. If, and I think if you really think about it, I mean, current blockchains, unfortunately, don't have much performance <laughs> to speak of or security, in my opinion. If you want those things, then you, you, you can't really do it in the old way. You got to do it in a way where everyone's at least pulling their weight, you know, where you can count on, mm -hmm. on nodes to really uh, do stuff. But, uh, you know, we've had, we're, I mean, um, I don't want to speak out of school here, but I mean, we're, we're very impressed by the kind of transaction uh, throughput that we can get off just basically what it's like, I don't know, somewhere between a plain old desktop and a gaming computer somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really quite stunning. I mean, so I, I think as computers improve, you know, since our things scale linearly, we're not really, yeah, I, don't, I think this situation will get better and better. But, the, you know, the other side of the issue is, you know, do, can you on a smartphone easily without burning up your battery or using up your data plan too much really check on the finality of transactions. So when you receive a payment, can you really check that it really ties back to the whole system or are you just believing that? So this is something that we're able to achieve, which I don't believe other networks have achieved. So it's really quite, uh, quite impressive that when a payment is made between two parties within let's say 10 seconds, each party receives a, uh, uh, self-authenticating when there's a, 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 a signature that's quantum resistant showing that the, the transaction was final. So right. that's mm -hmm. uh, uh, really awesome. So you know, we set, a, a, I think, a reasonable bar to, to let everyone participate on an equal footing and, and but through like these sophisticated breakthroughs in, in the algorithmics, uh, we achieve a great deal more than other, other uh, change in terms of leveling the playing field and, and letting, even if you're not running a node, you can be sure that your transactions are really secure. That's, that's something that hasn't been achieved before. Right. Thank, thank you so much for the answer to that. We have a few more questions, but I, I suggest that we first, uh, first continue the conversation and pick up some, some more questions afterwards. Um, so perhaps, uh, perhaps David, like last time that we, that we spoke, we, uh, we had a long conversation, a very, very nice conversation as well around all kinds of subjects, mostly relating to, uh, to, to privacy, democracy, voting, some things that I'm, that I'm very passionate about myself and, and, mm. and you are too. And, and yeah. I think that, uh, that shows very well also in the, in the whole setup of the XX coin. Um, but the conversations that we, that we had were also about how to, how to design voting in a more in a more fair in a more democratic way, right? Yeah. So that's that's really what I wanted to turn to here, and I think this is a really important, uh, and interesting uh, uh, subject. So, uh, so let's look at the first sentence here. I, I really mean that. Uh, it is an idiom from you know U.S. English, right? When you say something's the whole game, you mean that if you don't win that, you lose the whole war and everything. So is that really true? Is, is control of society the key thing? Well, I think that's pretty clear because you can think of society as a giant mechanism and, and a, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff happening, but setting the policy of, uh, of, of what's allowed to happen and what's not and, you know, actually uh, controlling that machine is, is the key thing. So it's, it, it's really about the power of, uh, uh, over society. And, and you know, if, if, if you can look at um, uh, the whole spectrum from you know, of, of, of countries with respect to democracy and, 
you, you know, you can see that today we're losing control over these governments. Actually, there's a report that shows that uh, apart from Switzerland, Denmark, and Finland, I believe, it has now happened that in all other countries that have voting, confidence in the, in the electoral system being able to, to uh, be effective is below 50%. And you can look at the trends, it's been dropping all over the, the world and it, it differs per region and so on, but it's, 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 a, it's a very serious uh, issue. And if once you lose control over governance, all is lost, right? Because, you know, you may think it's really great that we have blockchain and all that, but if all the governments in the world got together, we wouldn't be able to do it uh, if they didn't want us to, you know? So it, it, it's fun to be a rebel, you know, I've been, I've, I've uh, but uh, you also have to recognize that if you kind of lose the war, you lost the war and it's all over. And so it's really important that we find a way to sort of resurrect and, and, and boost up democracy and the power of, you know, so that public policy reflects what the public wants. That's a, a metric that's used in social science. And, you know, it's these days, uh, that metric doesn't look very good for very, very many places, but that's, that's really the whole thing. If we want to, if we want to create a decentralized world, we got to make sure that it's the governments don't all turn against us because then we won't have succeeded. And I think, and this is what Sylvan and I were, were talking about, it, 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 that this new approach to democracy called sample voting holds the key to really reinvigorating and uh, reestablishing democracy as an important thing and a viable thing. And, you know, I, I gave a talk about it a couple of years ago, and it was like a, a whole, in the uh, social choice theory, they have these big events every two years, and they I gave the keynote there, and I was shocked that, you know, they hadn't been working on this. So, um, they had, no one seemed to have known about it previously. Uh, I guess I invented sample voting, but we, we've run a, uh, a lot of test selections with some software, and we run a binding election for the Council of Europe. And now there's a real breakthrough in this, which I'm, I'd like to give, I think, the first public uh, presentation about here, uh, although it's up on the, on the GitHub. And this is an opportunity to start a sort of kickstart and try out sample voting. So why is sample voting important? Because we don't, have the ability to meaningfully control public policy today in a regime where every citizen is required to vote on every issue. You know, one person, one vote, yeah, but everyone has to vote on everything. What you get is basically everyone voting on almost nothing you're sort of able to vote on maybe which brand you think maybe you prefer or something. That's the way it is in the U.S. It's not very, uh, it, it's a very blunt instrument. Every few years or four years or whatever to vote, you know, select between two brands that are seem to have come as close together as they can. Um, it's a very blunt instrument. And, and the, uh, the idea of, you know, polling place voting uh, has a lot of issues and, so if you want to make voting a, an effective way to control governance, you know, you can't use stuff that was designed to work in the horse and buggy era where everyone could know their representative and you'd have to send a representative to the, you know, capital city because there was no other way to have your local voice heard. That, that, that's, you know, Current voting is just basically emulating that sort of a system, and it's it's uh, it it's so broken. It's it's people are 
somewhat oblivious to because, I mean, there's been a, it's been a hard fought battle to get voting rights, all kinds of groups. That is certainly the case, but there's, but I don't think one should confuse that with the, the, the need for more effective voting mechanisms today. You know, most representatives aren't even able to read the, the legislation that they pass, but you know, uh, let alone, you know, think about it and, and debate it and author it. I mean, it's the complexity of society today is not like it was when we had the French Revolution or the, the U.S. Constitution was framed. It's far more complex. Issues are far more complex. Things move much more rapidly because of, of, of you know, the technology that we're all working on. And so these mechanisms are, are um, the old mechanisms are inadequate, but, but the, the sample voting, is, it's just an amazing, beautiful thing. It, 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 it basically, what it does is it allows for a very inexpensive proof to be made of what a majority of the population would decide if they were able to study that issue for a week or two. And that's really the kind of thing that you want to steer society by. And so that's what, that's what sample voting uh, allows. And so I'd like to show you the first kind of, you know, we say toe in the water, you know, testing of sample voting here that I'm going to invite you to, uh, to help us test out and join in with an international group that's testing it. And, you know, maybe if you're not a U.S. person, you, you know, I'm sorry, but you can earn some uh, XX coins and, and really uh, be a part of, of this movement. And it should be a lot of fun, actually. It's a very cool thing. So let me just seg switch to that right now. This is something that I developed, although I've not, like, put my name all over it, but it's, uh, we call, I call it the seventh estate. And basically, I've claimed that seventh estate as the proven will of a majority of the public. So like, you know, the fourth estate might be the media and so on, but the seventh estate is when the public actually is proven to all, to a majority of, agree on a certain issue. This is the seventh estate. And I found a way to, and what you'll see here, to prove for like a thousand bucks, you can prove that a majority of people in Berlin or in Germany even because it scales, believe in it, would agree to a certain statement. And that's something that's never existed before. You know, you've had like protests and petitions and, you know, uh, letter writing and so on, but none of, it's, it's almost never happened that those things actually prove majority support. And they are becoming increasingly uh, risky and, and difficult because surveillance is now allowing the leaders to be identified and targeted. And we've seen this over and over again around the world in the last decade. So if you, if you want to rekindle and re-energize and allow democracy to exist and to create new hope in democracy, sample voting is the way because you, you can just you know, you let each voter just look at one issue. You give them a couple weeks. It's a, it's a clear cut yes or no decision. And they can do their own research online because, you know, that this is actually the way voting was done in Athenian Greece 2,500 years ago. So basically, Western civilization was created under a governance system that no matter what you've read, if you look into it, you'll see is all the binding decisions there were made by juries. And those juries were like 600,000 people. They weren't allowed to talk to each other. They heard the arguments from that there are no lawyers or judges, and they decided yes or no. And th in those days, if you were you know, a 26 year old or older citizen of Athens, you knew pretty much all the background about anything that would be needed to resolve a question about constitutionality of laws or about disputes and so on. So for the last 2,500 years, 
we haven't really had a world like that because society's become too large and too complex for, for everyone to be able to weigh in on everything. But we've just passed an inflection point where there are billions of smartphones out there and people are using them and they have access to search engines and everything and they can learn about an issue and dig in in depth and maybe, you know, query experts and people about it and so on. And that's, that's a huge difference. Because what that means now is, once again, after 2,500 years, the public is able to actually decide issues. And that's what the sample voting allows. It allows you to just sort of prove that you really randomly chose a set of people, like a thousand people, ask them to look at that one issue for that like six month period or whatever, and then they can be sure that their vote is counted because of the cryptography, it's very quite visible. And then you get this proof. And it's a very powerful thing. And now if you think about it in terms of blockchain governance, it's exactly what we have been needing because right now, you know, when you have a lot of different code updates proposed, everyone can't look at, check them all and weigh in. Most people don't have the bandwidth at least to do that, if, if, you know, if not the expertise and so on. But I think that if you were to randomly choose a small set of, you know, uh, a small, a particular update and ask a, a thousand people or something to look at it, they could weigh in much more authoritatively on that. And then altogether, you'd know that your updates weren't, you know, causing damaging things and, and that the, the, they were in, in the right direction. So in order to, to meet the complexity of just code updates in blockchain, we need sample voting. You know, and it's the same thing for, for a complex society. And so once you get enough people who have enough access and you have a mechanism like this that can prove that the choice is made randomly and that the votes are really counted accurately, uh, then you, you can do sample voting. It's, uh, it's a beautiful thing, but there's, there's a little flaw in the ointment, which is vote buying. And so, that, you know, if you allow vote buying, you're back to more money, you know, uh, more votes, right? That's, so what we want is everyone gets to vote the same amount, right? That's the idea of our uh, egalitarian blockchain. So we don't, we don't want vote buying. But, but don't forget, it's, you know, when you are not, if you're not voting, it's not often said, but, you know, make no mistake. If you're not voting in a polling place where people are watching, that you're not able to show how you vote to others, then you're voting in what's called technically remote voting. You're voting online. And in that case, you can always live stream your voting act, whatever it is. And you can show people how you voted and they can pay you to vote a certain way. And they could even threaten you to, you know, to vote a certain way. So it's a big, big problem that cryptocurrency with all its greatness is actually uh, precipitated. And, you know, it's of course very timely with the uh, uh, pandemic to be concerned about this, but really if you want to use sample voting to, so that the democratic mechanism can scale to the complexity of society, and different people can look at different issues and we can really go down to a much finer grain democracy than just voting for one or two between, you know, a couple of brands uh, or, you know, affiliating yourself with one of a half a dozen parties, um, then um, you, you really, uh, you need a way to, you need, you need sample voting. And so, it's not just sample voting that has the vote buying problem. We have created the vote buying problem now. And, and I will show you how we solve it in sample voting in, in this uh, seventh uh, estate system. So as you can see from this illustration here, the seventh estate actually works with paper ballots. And that's what makes it really easy to understand and, and, and to secure and fun to do. So let me, let me just show you a little bit about how this works. So when you say you wanted to run a seventh estate election yourself, well, all you have to do is, you know, so all the code is, uh, I, should, I should have mentioned this, all the, it's all implemented in Rust. It, it go to get to the seventh dash estate on the GitHub, 
You can see all the code. There's a demo video that walks you through the whole election process uh, uh, on you know the terminal. You can see all the how that works. And this booklet, which I'm uh, showing here, you know, I've given out many hundreds of these. It's a passport-sized booklet of just uh, like uh, 16 uh, pages. But this, uh, the, the, the PDF master of it is up there on the Git as well. And uh, this shows you how to do the whole thing. Um, so essentially, you know, you configure the election and you commit to this on the blockchain. And then you have to use about a thousand, less than a thousand dollars worth of supplies. The really expensive supplies are the stamps for the mailing, but you need some cardboard boxes and envelopes and cards to print the ballots on and these uh, scratch off labels you can buy. Um, and and, and, and uh, also labels to, to print the addresses on and, and this black tape and some other tape. So basically, if you wanna run one of these elections, you could do it yourself or you could use, uh, as it says here, secret sharing to share the keys with a number of people. So your, your, you know, your team can run the election and what you basically have to do is, you know, coax your printer into printing the labels from the common delimited lists. And then you cover the, and you put the stamps on the envelope saying you cover the addresses with the black tape. It's a, you know, really opaque tape, put a black tape. And then you, and then you print the ballots and you, now these ballots have vote codes on them, you'll see them in a moment. Uh, that's how the secure election technology works. So, uh, and you cover those with uh, the codes with the scratch off uh, so that basically these ballots and these envelopes, neither of them reveal anything confidential if you were to look at them at this point. And then what happens is, okay, we if you, if you get this, packing tape and use the boxes that we say and so on. You put a broomstick through there. You create this giant thing that lets all the ballots and the envelopes drop like six feet. And then you flip it again. It's really easy and fun. And then they all drop again. It's not that easy. Most paper ballot voting machines don't, or I don't think any of them actually are able to fully mix the paper ballots. You think it mixes them, but actually they just stack. And that's one of the privacy attacks on current uh, you know, so-called paper ballots, but but sort of we've developed this technology, and it's not easy to mix a bunch of envelopes and ballots without them getting all shredded. You know, you try to mix them too hard, they get wrecked. So we developed this way to do it. It's kitchen tested. It's proven. You tape the box with the tape like this. You, you know, you get this. It it all works, and it's easy to do, and the and the ballots don't get wrecked. And so basically, what that you know this randomization step does is make it sh make sure then when those ballots get put in those envelopes and there are ways you can do it and you can read about it in the booklet, no one can know which ballot was in which envelope or you know, which voter got which ballot, right? It's all double blinded. And, but you can still audit it uh, in a ceremony. So let me, uh, let me show you but the, how we handle the vote buying, how we prevent vote buying and in that, you'll see part of the ceremony, the audit part, but specifically for the, I don't want to, there's, I'm going to leave out a few uh, uh, frames of cartoons here. We'll skip right to the, the, how we prevent the vote buying. But you'll see part of the audit here. So here's, this is how a voter votes. You just scratch off by the yes or the no. And there you see the vote code, which is like a, you know, it's a, those are in a, random numbers that are, different per ballot and per position, and they have check digits to prevent typing errors and so on, and there's a, a ballot serial number, and by entering those, and sometimes we, we phrase it that the serial number is like the login, and the, the, the vote code is like the password, or there's a password and then a vote code, and the digits have, that's, that's user metaphor. We, we've done a lot of experiments. Pe you know, we ran real elections with this, and people don't have any problem with voting on the smartphones with this stuff. But this is the essence of it. There's a vote code and a serial number. And so you just enter those on the website. Now, the website doesn't know how you're voting. It's just recording this on the blockchain. And so it's, it's kind of neat because you can sort of choose the polling place that you want to go to. In a sense, you don't have to just go to a government. You could go to the one that you like because these are all sort of, uh, you know, uh, just need to get them posted on, uh, online. Um, and... 
but here, so here's the decoy, the way decoy ballots are handled that prevents the vote selling uh, and vote buying in, in, in the seventh estate system. So there's a special removable sticker that says, this is a decoy, you know, it's not gonna be counted. Put it, you know, take this out of your envelope, reseal the envelope and sell your vote and you can keep the money. But that vote, you're, you can be sure that that vote you're selling is not going to be counted, but no one will ever be able to find out that you sold them a decoy. Because no one will know which envelopes had those stickers in them. And because you could re take it off, it's a removable, and then you close it back up and you say, oh, let me, let me video me voting your way for you. Here you go. And so this shows, you know, this woman here is selling the, her, her vote. So here's the vote buyer saying, okay, you know, here's what you do, show me, I'm gonna open the envelope, vote it my way, and I'll send you the, the, you know, the Bitcoin or whatever it is. So that's, this, this is the problem, but, but she's kind of happy because she knows she's selling them a decoy, but they'll never find out. About, so how can she be sure that what she got was really a decoy? And it won't be counted because the last thing in the world she wants to do is vote the wrong way and have the real decoy be vote mailed to someone who would be voting her way. So you need what we call proof of decoy. And that's in this system through the ceremony here, this auditing. So you see, you, you put all those, those ballots in the envelopes that we saw uh, after they've been all tumbled around, right? And then you pull out a few of them and you check them. And the decoy ballots are, are different. They're from another pile because they're not going to be counted. And so some of those, she, she opens them, or they're revealed that everyone's videoing everything. So you can look online and those will be, those, those cryptographic commitments will be open and you can see that those really were decoys, the ones that she audited. But these other ones, you don't know which ones they, what they are, but you know that it's very likely that almost all of those are, are truly decoys. And so the ones that are open are shredded, and but the ones that are not opened, then those are indistinguishably mixed in with the whole uh, uh, box of ballots. I, you know, back on the, if we go back to the first page here, you see this scene, right, where after you, you have this ceremony and you've got all these, you know, you're live streaming at Six Ways to Sunday, and then you, you take those, those envelopes ready to mail and you maybe divide them up into different bags and send teams out send or the people who are there go to different like post offices around the city or whatever and put them in different different uh, collection boxes so that no one can stop them and if you read the uh, the booklet you'll see that it's even possible to make this national laboratory secure so that even if someone were to uh, get into the post offices and try to change those ballots or something yeah, because you make micro photographs of the ballots and post them online in, in an encrypted form. Later, if you reveal those, you will, you will, you know, this will be revealed. So anyways, you can, it's a very, you can't stop these elections and you can't tamper with them. And they can provide a proof of what a majority opinion of the, of the public is. And by using like the blind signatures, which we used on uh, the eCash, which, you know, Deutsche Bank issued in the 90s, you know, the stuff that DigiCash created, um, that, Deutschmarks in those days, but th that blind signature technology allows voters to receive like uh, lottery winnings for voting that are absolutely uncorrelated with their voting, how they voted. So instead of using lotteries to kind of, you know, cheat poor people and extract money like we do in the US, I don't know what, what maybe they do that in Europe too, make money for the government, Instead, we use lotteries to encourage people of all economic strata to vote, or you know, almost all. I mean, if you're really rich, I guess you don't really care if you win a lottery, but most people would. And so uh, that's a way to incentivize uh, participation uh, in these systems. So some people who have a lot of crypto might post, you know, put it up as a reward for a randomly chosen person who uh, actually does vote in the system, and that can help or other kinds of, you know, local prizes from, you know, uh, all kinds of, of tickets or restaurant meals or whatever it is, food-free stuff. So uh, you can, if you get some community support for some 
uh, prizes, then that can help incentivize people to really participate uh, in the election. So basically, you know, this is our call to action. We've got teams now in Chile, England, uh, Portugal, and the Cayman Islands who have said they want to run these elections. And I think it would be a big pity if Berlin wasn't on that list. So I'm, I'm really hoping that, you know, one or more of the people here will uh, reach out to, uh, this is Mario at, at our Exit Network is coordinating this. And, uh, you know, you, it's an opportunity to earn uh, our coins and to, to support the project and support the sample voting. And, you know, it's kind of a fun thing to do, you know, to have that ceremony and everything. And no one can stop you from doing it. And if you can choose an issue that you think, you know, governments and people should know that a majority of people are, you know, how they feel about that issue. All you need is a mailing list from the region that you want to cover. And then the cost is always about the same because you just, you know, statistically a thousand ballots is, is uh, could be plenty. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from people. In, uh, and, and, you know, there's other, uh, we've got some other initiatives, which I'll, I guess I have here, you know, so we have a fully digital form of sample voting, which we haven't announced yet uh, in detail, but this, you know, if you join us in helping prove sample voting out, then if you're a developer, this might be the kind of thing that you'd also like to be involved in. And we are able to compensate people for helping with uh, this project. And we're looking forward to community involvement. I would really rather not be making our own voting system just, you know, uh, as a matter of principle. Um, so it's purely digital. Uh, of course, it, it's, it, it works with our XX consensus and, and messaging uh, technology. It's like quite integrated and intimate with them. And it has the provable properties that the, you know, the selection is, uh, is random. And you see this type of voting technology. I, you can look at, if you go to charm.com, you can see some of the things I've done and there's the old eCash museum, but there's a couple voting sites uh, also listed there as projects. You scroll down and you'll see that one of them, uh, we ran the elections in Tacoma Park, Maryland, which is a city in Maryland. We ran municipal elections. It was the first, you know, publicly verifiable binding public election. Uh, that was done with my technology, which is very similar to what's in the seventh estate and will be in the digital estate. It's a, a way to keep all the ballots encrypted but prove that you're really adding them up correctly without revealing which ballots contribute which you know votes to the to the tally. But it proves mathematically rigorously that the tally is accurate. And independent auditor teams, and we had several for those elections, uh, write code which checks the published encrypted values, and then we randomly you know based on the blockchain open some of them, and those are all audited. It's a it's a relatively straightforward process. It doesn't use any fancy cryptography; just one way functions just hashing. And, and uh, so it's pretty well established in, in the literature and uh, in practice. Um, so that's part of the seventh estate as well. And you can see all that code when you go uh, to the to the get. And then, of course, we will solve the uh, uh, the vote buying with the decoys in the digital uh, estate as well. That's a, a, obviously a critical part of any kind of non-polling place. So basically any kind of meaningful voting, in my opinion, uh, going forward globally. So this is a really important technology. Um, so so, I, so I, yeah, so before I switch. Yeah, please. Uh, there was a very interesting question from the audience that I wanted to, uh, wanted to bring sure. up. Hey, great, um, great. And, and, <laughs> um, and, and basically, uh, uh, stating that that's uh, for, for this, for sample voting to work, hmm. It is dependent on the uh, on the electorate to be to be very well informed, right? And putting the work in. No, I, I wouldn't say that. No, I think that's no? wrong. Okay. 
No. <laughs> can, can, no. Can, you, can you elaborate on that? Well, yeah, so we, we've run binding sample elections for the Council of Europe. Uh, it worked quite well. Um, so, you see, it's, if you contrast sample voting with everyone votes on everything voting, right, which is the only thing we could compare it to, I believe, right, yes. then they're quite different because everyone votes on everything means that no one really has deep expertise in anything they're voting on. And generally, you know, in most countries, you get what we call drop off. So in other words, people vote for president and maybe one more office, and then they don't do the vote in the last stuff. It's very, so basically, you're providing people with such a dumbed down choice that's really hard, you know, because let me be quite frank, if you don't mind, I mean, I know that, you know, when you talk about politics, you do know, this, that's a whole different thing, and it's maybe not my place, but of course, in the US, we vote for president, so they say they're gonna do stuff, and then they don't usually do it, mostly, but there's nothing we can do about that. And if you look at the kinds of uh, policy that public wants compared to what's in uh, actually government policy, they're completely different on almost every single class of issues of public policy. You can study it. It's, if you're interested in that, let me know. I have a whole thing about that that I've, I've researched. It's quite interesting. Um, so, uh, and I think, you know, when you have the sort of European uh, approach, you know, which is the other way to do it, not first past the post, but proportional representation, uh, you know, basically you're giving your vote to your party. And then your party is cutting some deals with other parties and so on, right? If you're lucky. So, Basically, it's a everyone votes on everything. The way it works today, it's a it's such a blunt instrument, and it's so ineffective at setting public policy that it's a fact that public confidence in it is is so low that you can't even believe any of the votes now because there no you don't even have a majority turnout. So it's, you know, it's, this is, it's over. It just doesn't work. And I'm sorry to have to say that. So with sample voting, it's quite different. It's like, okay, I'm asked to, to look into this one issue. Well, I don't really know much about it, but I can read about it on Wikipedia, re do some research, read some articles, maybe send an email or, you know, someone or watch some videos of some presentations. And in a couple of weeks, usually I can find out enough about that issue. That's what I, you know, like friends and family who aren't involved in technology, I see them researching issues that they're interested in quite effectively. I think most people in the public think that if they really wanted to know about one thing nowadays, they could probably figure that one thing out. And then when you do figure that out, you know, so there's a, there's a proven fact in social science literature, which is that when people are nominated like to juries, when they're given, they're randomly chosen to have a special say on an issue, they rise to the occasion. There's, it's, a, it's quite startling. They take it extremely seriously. They cancel all their weekend events. They, they're willing to you know, do whatever. It's the, read the literature on it. It's, it's really stunning. So, you know, people appreciate it, it, the fact that, you know, that, that when they're asked to, decide something significant and that their input will really actually influence the outcome, it's a whole different game. So that's how you get engagement. You know, if you look at, if you look at the history of Athenian democracy, yeah, for the first 20, 30 years, you know, yeah, it was run by the public, you know, but people, it took them a while to rise to the occasion and really you know, start informing themselves and, and take their role in running the, the city-state uh, seriously. And it, you see a similar thing, like, remember the Swiss newspaper readership and the quality of the newspaper is very, very much higher than any place else in the world because, because the Swiss have more say about their governance. And what is said about the Swiss, and I can't really say this is a fact, but as far as I have read, you know, when Swiss meet, instead of having, like, you know, hating each other because they are on different sides of some camp that's, that they've been told, you know, is an, a critical thing, they tend to just have policy debates about issues 
that are that are that you know that they're being asked to, to decide about. So it's a, it creates just a very different mindset, and it's very engaging, and it, it creates a a, a, t a totally different thing. So, I mean, in a sense, the question that was asked is 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 right because yes, you do need a more informed electorate, but the the good news is this is something you can actually inform yourself on because you're. It's about something that will actually be locked in and will matter, and it's clear enough cut, and it, you know, and you're given the time to focus on it. But also, there's a whole new kind of uh, cultural um, support for for being more informed and and, and participating. I mean, you know, in, in Athenian uh, Greece during uh, the classical era, the biggest uh, 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 you know, uh, criticism you could have of anyone was that they weren't doing their part to help govern it. That was like considered like you know the 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 worst possible uh, type of person. And um, you know, it, so once you actually have the ability to effectively control governance, then yeah, people will, and it it it'll, and this will rekindle confidence in democracy, and it's the only way to make the world actually be decentralized. So be, con be concerned about what people want, not what central, what more money, more votes wants. Right, that's more a- More money, a, more votes. Is... They always <laughs> vote for things that make it better for more money, more votes. Right. No matter right, what right. they say, it's, oh, it'll trickle down. It'll be, you know, we're, of course, but it's good for you. No, no, it never happens that way. Uh, you look at, you know, last few hundred years, it's pretty clear or whatever, whatever time window you want to consider. You know, let me just wax a little philosophically for a second. You know, thousands of generations of humans have given an awful lot and made a tremendous sacrifice to bring us to the point where we are now, where we really have the ability to take control of society and, and create a kind of decentralized world where all of the uh, uh, public's intellect can be engaged in taking us to the next level. This is the opportunity we have. You know, it's not about rich guys going to space or some nonsense like that. It's, it, we, if you look at the history of civilization, it's always been about network effects and more ideas created in more powerful societies. That's why Europe was able to, to dominate the Americas and, and Australia and so on. It's because they had a larger society. They had more ideas, more innovation. And, and so, you know, right now we're at a critical juncture because the technology is so far outstripped you know, the usual, all the existing sort of norms and rules of the game that we have to take, uh, use the technology to take control over the technology or others will use it to take control over us. And, uh, you know, you right. don't have to look that far to see, you know, some people's vision of what, someone asked me yesterday, I was at another conference, they said, well, what do you think about the smart city initiatives, you know, in Canada and so on? Well, look at look at the the smart cities they built in China. You know, some of those don't seem like a place I'd like to live. And you know, what, I said what we're trying to do is build our own virtual city here. And uh, and what I should have said is, you know, yeah, smart cities, right? I think that smart people will want to move to our city. Uh, and you know, it, it's this is a unique moment in time, and and, and also because of the pandemic. But because of the, the, where we are at this inflection point in, 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 uh, with technology, to actually you know vote with our, our user interface mice or touch or whatever, click and and uh, create a world that is you know what I think everyone in blockchain wants, uh, but is you know you, you can't just just because you're moving in the right direction doesn't mean you're doing the right thing. What we need to do is come together, pull together and move things forward uh, expeditiously in a focused manner. So, you know, when I was growing up, I often heard this expression, 
If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And you know, it, it never really resonated exactly with me, but these days, you know, I'm really starting to see it. Just because you're, you know, typing away, making some stuff that other people could reuse or something, or you're doing something that's sort of in the right direction, or you're you're in favor of paper ballots, or you know, whatever it is, this is a is a fallacy. Uh, you're part of the problem. The, the only way to really make the world a better place is to keep your eye on the prize, which is the control mechanism, and to make sure that the public gets access to that control mechanism sooner rather than later. And that's, you know, that's what decentralization is about, and that's what is a strictly necessary condition for it. So, you know, you're kind of like fiddling while Rome is burning if you're, you know, working on some some open source project that, uh, you know, maybe someday might, you know, whatever, make file storage more efficient or I don't know, whatever, you know, I mean, this is the time to pull together and recognize what's really important. That's, that's, that's governance. And how can we have scalable governance that works for the complexity and scale and that works online. And we need to make that happen and deploy it and use it to, to run our own stuff like, like, the XX network, so that, you know, to show that it could work. So that's why we're like, I'm extremely excited about being able to sponsor people actually, you know, running some elections uh, and, and, and testing this stuff out and, and kind of, um, you know, gaining some uh, traction for this, this uh, sample voting, which is, yeah, just clearly, the, you know, really the only way through, so to speak. Uh, so, 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 David, um, like yeah. some some of the questions coming through, and there were been quite a few in the last couple of minutes, um, all, all all around the same line. So, let me try to synthesize them and pack okay. them perhaps into one kind of um, overall question. Sure. It, it does it does resonate a lot about about the information gathering and especially with um, let's let's perhaps think about Cambridge Analytica, how oh, yeah. how how yeah. this company. Uh, yeah. Use Facebook and 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 the systems and the yeah. APIs available to basically uh, like influence public opinion. Of course, yeah. if you if you separate this in, um, in 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 samples, you're never gonna know where those samples are and and who you're going to influence directly. I suppose. No, 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 no. But, the sample, but, 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 sample but, is not public. Sure, it's secret. exactly. So no exactly. one. So if you look at influenceability, hmm. sample elections are far harder to influence if you read go to rsvoting.org and the read the white paper there you can learn a lot more about sample voting but one of the things about it is it's much harder to influence by um uh you know media and and, and fake news and so on because you can run continuous sample votes so you don't have it doesn't have to be episodic every four years you could basically, you know, all governments have succession rules. You know, if so-and-so can't do it, then this other, these other people fill in. Every government has that. And so, you know, when the public loses faith in governance, then, then you just, so, you know, it's not like, it's, it's a very uh, uh, different thing. Let me talk about Cambridge Analytica real quick here with respect to this slide, because, you know, I mean, that's what XX really is aimed at, is if you go back and look at, you know, some of the earlier videos I've done, um, perhaps you've seen some of them, I talk about a protected sphere that's necessary for participation in governance. So that means that you need to be able to exchange messages with your friends and family being certain that no one's spying on you, that you can frankly discuss whatever political issues you want. And this is very important. Actually, surveys show that's one of the main things people want to do with social media. But you also have to be able to pay for information content and be paid to be like a journalist or provide information. If you have that infrastructure, it's a, I call that a protected sphere. From that, you can and only from, with that kind of protection can you meaningfully participate in governance. Absent that, you feel the, the, you know, 
what's called in the literature, the chilling effect of the panopticon. You know, you, you're not really likely to look at the information that you want to to form your real opinion or to vote the way you really want and so on and associate with people. So you need a protected sphere in order to be a participant in democracy. And that's exactly an, what XX Network provides. Metadata shredding, messaging, and payments. So that's what's shown here. This is, sometimes I call that metadata shredding. Cambridge Analytica was all about using the metadata, right, to figure out who was who and, 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 and influence them. Here, we hide the social graph, the metadata, because messages are, are mixed in very large batches. Um, so that, now you might say, well, but privacy is hopeless because look at all the video cameras and the internet of things and this and that, and you know, surveillance, the government and so forth. Well, no. You know, when I look at things, I'd say, well, okay, that's great. There's a huge thing there, but who control, what controls it? You know, what controls the, uh, the, the voters, I mean, the, the part of voters that are, is needed to be protected by this sphere is just the part needed to formulate these views and express their votes. The rest of, you know, you're walking around and other stuff, that doesn't need the same kind of protection. Now, once society is, is you know, controlled by the public for, pub, you know, public interest, then maybe there, some of these other kinds of surveillance will be uh, reduced or, you know, uh, attenuated. But, uh, you know, what I'm suggesting here is a, a way to move from success to success to get to the goal that we really need. So is the, is the camera, is, it, is everyone seeing me or Sylvan? I think we should be seeing you. I, oh, because I see a green box around you. So ah, I'm all right. No, but I'm trying I to gesture here. Um, to, I don't know if, if you're seeing that in the audience, but yeah, you know, so the sample voting with, with the seventh state totally under your control. You want to run a sample voting election? You got a thousand bucks, no one can stop you. That's a very, very powerful thing. It's never existed in the history of, of, of democracy before to be able to prove a majority support for an issue uh, and it, be able to do that without having to ask, you don't have to ask for permission. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's exactly because of Cambridge Analytica and now, you know, there's many other shoes to drop, you know, when this, when the fact that votes can be bought online becomes, a, you know, something that's talked about publicly, uh, you know, it's, it's just one of the several things that will be used to, uh, to, you know, suppress voter participation. So we are at a point now where, you know, democracy is in a, like over a 10, 20 year timeline, uh, you can see is, is really uh, declining and, uh, you look up. You can look up that uh, uh, this, this study. Is uh, uh, show voter confidence. You, know, you see, you know, voter confidence is a very important part of of representative democracy, right? And voter confidence is being eroded dramatically by saying, "Oh, the machines don't count right. They flip the votes. The, you know, the, they're hacked. Uh, the Cambridge Analytica. The this. The that. All that works against democracy." Right? People don't feel like they really need to participate. And then it, it's all over. And we're very close to that right now. So we have, have a chance because of blockchain and with the seventh estate to actually, you know, change the tides. And it's, it's totally uh, within, our, within our reach to, uh, to do so. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, if, uh, you, 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 yeah. If you if you believe in the centralized world and blockchain, you gotta you gotta have a effective governance for it. And so far, we haven't seen any. And this is a way to do it, but it has broader implications. And actually, it's kind of a recursive thing, right? Because blockchain itself, through something like XX Network, can provide the means for the public to express its will and influence the. the uh, governance and and it's sort of you know reverse the tie to reinvigorate confidence and participation in, in democracy. 
So thank, thank you so much, David, for for sharing so much insight around uh, <laughs> around around this uh, random yeah. sample voting. I think I think it's hugely interesting. We've got some great great response from the audience. A lot of questions, so some of some of which that we that we couldn't answer yet. Oh, okay. um, being uh, but but I, I think I think there's a lot more information to be explored also for people. We posted the links to the to uh, to the white paper to the GitHub. Oh, you did. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. also to GitHub and the white paper on ours voting. So exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's, thank you very much. Yeah. And then, um, and then we also posted Mario's address, Mario at XX yeah, yeah, if, if people want up. to reach out. And we'd, we'd love to, you know, back you in, in doing this and like you to be part of the whole uh, group that's doing this uh, internationally. Even if you can't do it locally, you could also maybe help other people do it uh, a bit if, you, if you're, you know, a little more of a developer or uh, want to help, uh, you know, in some way. This, this would be really great. Um, so am I, do I have a couple minutes to just really give a quick wrap please, up? Please, please, yeah, if, if you, company, yeah. Because I'm, I am asked uh, to do that. Um, so this is the sample voting, is our call to action. So just real, uh, and I talked about the, the digital estate voting. So like if you're a developer or, you know, cryptographer or, or you know, interested in these things and want to help us with this, we are all, there's also, also people who are, outside of our organization who are starting to help us with this and we are able to compensate them. And that's, uh, that's, uh, this is an uh, exciting uh, project. It's a little bit more technical. And so if you would like to, you know, if you've got a couple thousand euros and want to, you know, deploy uh, a node, like the hundreds of other people apparently want to do it and, you know, get paid uh, an XX coin to do it, uh, and you're not a U.S. person, and you're not in the U.S., then uh, you can, uh, you know, for a limited time only, as they say. You know, the last sign-up was a year ago, so now we opened it for just two weeks because we got so many people saying, oh, I want to, uh, you know, why can't you let us new people in? So we're doing this one last uh, violet. Uh, so we had the uh, blue and the red and the teal teams. That gave us about 650. Uh, people that went through the, the public process. Uh, it was a very open process where we, you know, uh, surveyed people about what they thought should be in the process. We ran a very open way. So, so we're running a new, uh, like a, the same process, but in a slightly more uh, compressed time frame, um, uh, so that the people who go through this will hopefully hit the ground at just the right running the time when, you know, they can really participate in running uh, a node and get the first, uh, you know, be in the first month of, of that. So if this is a uh, rare opportunity to join in now. And uh, I just want to point out that we have been running the XX Collective. You saw in the timeline for uh, like a year and a half, and it's you know, got 6,500 6, people or something. It's a, on your smartphone. Keep track of what we're doing. And uh, you can also see the performance of the network and help us test stuff and you know if you're on that list then you might get uh, access to things that other people don't or you know whatever get first first information about things so please join our collective um, if you'd like to and you know we, we sold some of these coins and um, we've got a good base now of uh, several hundred people that are you know KYC and really uh, backing us for, at early stage. And so we're uh, really enthusiastic about that. And if you go to the site, you can, like I said, you can see the webs, the, here's the barcode, scan that. You know, you can see the, uh, the white papers, the technical papers that back it up. And, um, you know, there's a lot happening in the next like 30 days. So we've already posted part of the code. We're committed to post the rest of it next month. We've got all these, you know, the, the soft launch of the of the betas coming up like next week, and 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 it, so it's all there's tons of stuff uh, going on, and um, it'd be it'd be great if you're uh, interested to you know follow it and join us or or uh, run an election or uh, or whatever, and um, yeah, so that's uh, basically uh, what I wanted to uh, mention about the. the the, the broader project, yeah. 
Thank you so much, David. This, is, uh, this has been very insightful, very helpful. And I hope that people will, uh, will actually step up and, and get involved in, uh, in all the beautiful things that you're, that you're working on. Thank <laughs> you.